relation between the U.S. and China in one word. This mall is a decline in trade in vegetable. It goes without saying, but I will say it anyway. The recent visit to Taiwan by U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi certainly didn't help the already strained relation much, but within her reasoning for deviance of Beijing, the democracies of the world must stand together. The Chinese embassy has now threatened to go to war with the U.S. over Taiwan. In the aftermath of the visit, as I tap the keyboard producing this article, China will be finishing its theater of shock and away around the island, including its disruption of trade through the Strait of Taiwan. Of note, 60% of maritime trade passes through Asia, with the South China Sea carrying an estimated one-third of the global shipping. The Chinese Defense Ministry, prior to the total waste of good ammunition, has previously released a map around the island where he said they would conduct air and sea exercises as well as long-range live fire exercises. All sea vessel, cargo ship included, had been warned to stay out of the areas during the drills. Ah, politics and trade, they sort of go together like soap and sandwich. You can't have one without the other. Taiwan has called the military exercises the equivalent of a maritime and aerial blockade, as it threatened to disrupt trade passing through one of the world's busiest shipping lanes. In the meantime, China has cut off communication with the U.S. in several diplomatic areas. Inclusive of top military press open line of communication, which is very dangerous at this juncture given the recent activity in the China Sea. Honestly, our diplomatic relationship with China has reached an all-time low, which begs the question, gosh, aside from threatening to kill each other, how are we doing in bilateral trade? Back in time, a couple decade plus within a calmer geopolitical landscape, even prior to China joining the WTO, trade between the two countries was showing sign of steady growth. The WTO membership was essentially meant to ensure permanent normal trade relation, providing U.S. and foreign companies some certainty that they could produce product in China and export it to the United States. This didn't fact work as trade forged ahead at a record pace. Opportunity between the U.S. and China created $100 billion in bilateral trade in 2001 alone. Look where we are now. In 2021, the total value of the U.S. trade in goods with China was approximately $657 billion U.S. and $151 billion U.S. in the export value and $506 $506 billion on import. Through June of 2022, according to the U.S. Census, imports were approximately $272 billion and exports stood at around $72 billion, which puts us on track for approximately $700 billion in bilateral trade by the end of 2022. Given all the obstacle, autocracy versus democracy, China Z activity, intellectual property theft, government subsidies and dumping cheap product into the US, China tariff and etc. This is quite an impressive number. Speaking of obstacles that I believe have hampered the bilateral trade numbers from climbing toward the trillion mark annually, such as the Section 301 tariff, there is a new dark cloud in the picture, which is a more forceful forced labor initiative. Yes, it's been around for a while, but it was never the monster that it is today. Our partner and founder, Adriane Breu Miller and BLG attorney Harold Jackson, have written a couple of good articles that you may choose to read that outline the due diligence necessary in getting product into the U.S. without customs snagging in it a WRO withhold release order or a binding. 
primer on forced labor enforcement for U.S. importers, both are not good when it comes to proving that one's product was manufactured or produced with no forced labor involved. It's almost an exercise in futility given the demand that an importer is tasked with in putting the pieces of the puzzle together A until Z. All third-party supply line included for custom to evaluate and subsequently make a determination in your favor. When it comes to product manufactured in China, it gets even more difficult, especially the Uyghur Autonomous Region. If this area of China is included in the product's origin, it's inevitable that it will be seized at the U.S. port by custom, and therefore one is guilty until proven otherwise, and there isn't much time to do so. More specifically, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act (OFPA), which took effect on June 21, 2022 bans the importation of all goods made in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region in China. Good important from the Suar or good whose input raw materials or component are made from goods from the Suar CBP will presume that those goods were used using forced labor and is directed to seize the good open and try. They have to, it's the law. I have now sat through six expert presentations in the past three months of the topic of forced labor. Half were presented by our attorney at Preo Miller Law Group and Total Law, and what a U.S. importer must do in order to comply, and quite frankly, I have my opinion, but I do not wish to give up and simply call it amended by the U.S. Trade Representative to stop doing business with China. Section 301 tariff opened the door to this, and it was up to the international trade lawyers like us to go to Washington, D.C. and prove that our claim product could not be sourced and or produced anywhere else in the world except China. These accepted pleas were called exclusion. We did fairly well at about 60% acceptance for the commenced department as the national average was around 33 percent but it was never enough and many companies were bankrupted by the policy implemented in 2018 by the trump administration to punish china and perpetuated by the biden administration to this day However, Omnius Section 301 remains. The forced labor initiative make it pale in comparison. That is, China is the sourcing capital of the world. Thank you.